Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies believe everyone should have access to affordable and equitable health care. And until every baby goes home with a healthy parent, until patients and caregivers speak the same language, until routine care becomes routine, Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies will work to make health care more affordable and equitable for everyone in every zip code. All for the health of America. That's the benefit of Blue. This is Troy McGuinness, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising Podcast. Greetings, and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Hersko. So, this week's episode, we are going to be talking about a book that recently came out that actually is one of the better books I've picked up in a while, which all of you know that I read a lot It's saying something. Uh, we are talking about the professional agile leader and joining us this week to talk about the book is one of the co-authors, Kurt Bittner. Kurt, thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Glad to be here. We are we are excited to have you. So, Kurt, for before we dive into the book, for people who may not be familiar with you or your work, could you give us a, a quick intro as to who are you and how you either fortunately or unfortunately ended up talking to me to the, this evening? Yeah, well, uh, we've talked a number of times before, and, and it's always an interesting conversation. Um, so, background is that I'm uh, at Scrum.org. I'm mostly these days uh, working on. The Scrum.org book series and the, the Professional Agile Leader is, is one of those books. Um, sometimes I edit the books and sometimes I'm a co-author in this, this particular book, I'm a co-author. Um, I've, gosh, I've been doing software and Agile stuff for now for over 40 years. Um, and, uh, and, and when I say that, people are often surprised. But when I first got out of college, I ended up working in a relatively small group um, outside of an IT department, basically in a user department. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I knew how to write code though. And it seemed to me to really make a lot of sense to develop stuff and, and deliver it, you know, every couple of weeks. And we did that and then gradually, you know, we were successful with that. And then I was able to hire people and we ended up with a, a relatively small team, I think, you know, seven or eight people. Um, but that's just the way we worked. And we didn't know enough to know that that was not a good way to work. <laughs> right, and right. so all these, so all these years later, um, you know, here I am still doing that kind of stuff and talking about it. And, you know, it always surprises me that people think that, that, you know, that somehow in a sense, what we used to call the waterfall approach is a good idea because it's, I just didn't have the patience for it. So anyway, I ended up, doing this. And uh, along the way, I've worked for software companies, done consulting, done agile transformation work, worked as an industry analyst, um, writing things. And and so um, anyway, I, I think now what I like doing about the writing part is that I'm try to, trying to shed some different light on this subject. I mean, this is one where mm -hmm. since you read a lot of books, you, you know that there are tons of books out on this subject. Um, and usually the motivation for me to write a book is that I haven't read the book that I want to read. Right. <laughs> I, I haven't read that. And so it's like, well, I'm going to have to write it because, um, you know, no, no one else is going to. So anyway, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's rewarding uh, and, and interesting and hope, and I'm glad to hear that you've got a lot out of the book and hope that other readers um, feel the same way. I, I really did. So the, for our listeners who haven't, seen the book the the subheading is a the leader's journey toward growing mature agile teams and organizations and one of the things you just said kurt really resonated with me because you do you and your co-authors say at certain times of the book you know this is just a one example of many this may work for you that may not but based upon our experiences these are the common themes and threads that we've come across that resonate and that was that was for me the selling point because the, the there was a there was a great interview uh, he was by a project manager of all people uh, interviewed by Jim O'Shaughnessy, and he made the remark about everybody tries to recreate somebody else's success by copying that as like a template, as a rubric. 
And if you're copying the rubric, you're going to get diminishing returns because the system, the scenario is never exactly the same as when the rubric was created. And that is a really, really insightful way to look at these transformations where, yes, they're stochastic in the sense that they're all the same, but they're not when you get down to brass tacks. And that, I think, is where some people get a little bit wrapped around the axle. So. I, I wanted to dive in because there's some there's some really wild quotes in this book that I've I've highlights and, and flags all over the place. And on page ten, you had me sealed, Kurt. On page ten, you had me sealed because there's a quote um, in in the in the opening of the book, and, and I'm going to read it verbatim because this is really really resonant to me. And the quote is: "The irony of agile organizational transformation is that while eventually the people in the organization will need to learn to become more self-managing and collaborative when they make decisions." The early stages of the change require the agile leader to be somewhat dictatorial. So I read this and my brain was like, finally, somebody agrees with me. And that's, it's almost antithetical to, to the whole culture of safety, psychological safety, you know, take it to the team sort of thinking, right. but right. that resonates with me. And can you, can you give us a little background and explain to our audience how I'm not crazy, how this actually does make sense at the start to put a little bit tougher bounding box around your expectations? Yeah. Um, so, you know, th- this this is one of those um, sort of hard one, um, you know, having to sort of spit the teeth out of the back of your mouth kind of <laughs> observations that um, that we, we, we came up with. But the the reality is, is that when you're trying to change a traditional organization, you're working with a system that is hardwired to destroy you. Um, it doesn't want to change. And, and it's largely controlled and led by a bunch of people who have no incentive to change. <laughs> they, they get their bonuses based on individual contributions. They, you know, they're, they're wired into the MBO system. They, you know, they're, they're largely in, in a status reinforcing network in which the, the most important thing is for them not to look bad. And you're trying to introduce a system in which you're, you want to introduce experimentation. And in a sense, um, you know, to, to sort of tie into, um, you know, some of the, the learning organization kind of ideas, you, you want to create an organization that can learn. And right, in right. order to do that, you have you have to be willing to make mistakes. Um, and it's not that's even that's that language isn't even the right language. You have to be willing to try things that are going to turn out differently than you expect them to. Right. And that's a good thing. Um, you know, somebody said one time the most important phrase in science is not Eureka. I found it. It's huh. That's interesting. <laughs> that's not what I expected. Um, and it's the same. And it's the same thing for agile organizations. So what, what that dictatorial leader, in a sense, has to do is they have to create the space in which, other, in which the organization can start to learn how to work in a different way. And because of these forces that are aligned against that kind of way of working, they have to be, you know, in a sense, powerful enough and protective enough to hold the rest of the organization off while some small part of it starts to learn and then gradually keep protecting that until you've got a critical mass. And then, you know, one of, you know, later on we can talk about this dual operating model and and sort of the the, you know, temporarily you have to you have to recognize the dual operating model is is reality, but eventually you have to make the choice of which way you're going to go because it's it's a little like I, I said one time to somebody, you know, it's a little bit a little bit like Baltimore and Harry Potter. Neither one can live while the other one lives. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very, very <laughs> <And> true. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, we'll we'll get to that later. But but that's sort of the idea, and and you know this idea that somehow I mean we've seen it just total disasters happen where in a sense somebody says, okay, teams, you know you're all self managing now, and everybody looks around and goes, is this a trick? Um, you know, can we really believe them? And 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 then they start acting in a self managing way, and then they're, and then at some point somebody gets threatened by that and the whole organization comes down in their heads and then they never try again. Um, right, right. They get, they get their wrist slapped or you get told this isn't going to work or um, uh, what is it? The, is it a, a Peter Senge? Is it his quote where when you push against the system, yeah, yeah. the system pushes back? Um, right, 
it's all those things that we experience. Simon Wardley had a quote where if you're in, if you're new to an organization, your best odds of success are making massive change within the first 90 days. And his remark was after 90 days, those organizational antibodies, which are to your point, used to working in a way, getting incentivized a certain way, they start pushing back because they're based, they're the equivalent of detecting a foreign body inside a biological right. system. Your immune system rises right. up to, to stomp on it. Um, so you talked about the dual operating model, which I think we talk about again later. Uh, uh, one of the things I want to ask about, though, is you're talking about leaders need to be dictatorial to create the space to make the change. And they need to carve out that chunk of the org that is going to be okay to experiment and to quote uh, Dan Mezik, be prepared to be surprised. You have another, there's another section early in the book where you're talking about how to change an org one team at a time. And you have, uh, again, these are money quotes, which I wish everybody would pay more attention to. While organizations are often tempted to aim for broad adoption of agile techniques, they are rarely rewarded with success. <laughs> Shot one. Uh, what begins with a well-intentioned sharing tends to end in unfocused, watered-down, superficial agility that does not build a foundation for success. And I would challenge any of our listeners to think about how many transformations you've been part of where this is the end result that it ends. It's a very much schizophrenic, very poorly, poorly orchestrated attempt. And, and then the next paragraph, you double down on that, Kurt, where you talk about the worst approach is to be to try and change an existing team or department, which has already solidified working relationships and behavior patterns. Changing the way of working inevitably changes team dynamics and threatens relationships. While breaking up existing teams may seem costly and unproductive, trying to change the way an existing team works is nearly impossible. I read that and I had my eureka scream <laughs> on the plane. I was like, well, thank you. Somebody put it in words because we're humans and that's what we do. And trying to change somebody who's already into a rhythm it's it's right. near impossible near impossible right yeah you see existing teams you know they, they've got existing power dynamics in the team they've got you know some people who are more dominant some people who are less dominant and those relationships are already established and then you try when you try to introduce a new system it upsets those relationships and and so whether people understand it that it's happening and are doing it consciously or whether it's simply unconscious and people are just feeling uncomfortable. Um, you know, the, the, the best thing that you can do is, and, and we, we talk about this in the book is that um, you start basically with a bunch of new team members and you let them self-select who's going to be in, uh, on the team. And that's a, it's a complex process. It's not something you can do. Okay. Wednesday afternoon, we're all going to, you know, form, form the team. Because you know you've got to get to know each other, kind of interview each other, and and gradually coalesce around who the new team members are going to be. But if you can't trust, and we say this in the book, if you can't trust a team to make a decision about that, how can you trust them to do anything else? And right, so right, you know that's that's really the starting point about building confidence on the team is to say you really are responsible for who who you work with and. Some of the biggest disasters that I've seen is where some manager assigns people to work on an agile team, and some of those people don't want to be there. You know, we've had people who are assigned to be a product owner, and they used to be a business analyst, and they like being a business analyst, and they like writing their hum humongous requirements document, and they thought that was a good way to work, and now you're telling them don't do that, and that, that's a wrong way to work, and they're reacting going, wait a minute, you know, I thought I was mm -hmm. a professional, and I, I thought that I was, you know, really doing my job well, and now the first thing you do is tell me that I'm shitty at doing my job. <laughs> How is that person ever going to be successful? Right, so. right. And and your remark about someone thinking, well, now you, you tell me I'm doing terrible at my job. M humans, most humans, they equate change with failure or they equate change with loss. I'm losing my, in this example, it's my, my corporate respect, the respect that the role I was doing, because you're telling me you need me to go from role A to role B. And if it's not clear to me, I'm I'm interpreting that as I either wasn't doing a great job or that I've lost my stature, my standing in my peer group. And, and that's okay. That's, a, that's biologically how we're wired. But as good leaders, we need to be cognizant of that. Yeah. And, and you have to support people through that change and, 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 be, and be aware and even, even say things like, you know, um, Kurt, th this is, this is going to be hard for you. But I know that, you know, I, I, I've observed 
you on, on other projects and I've seen you working really well in this new way and, and, and we think you can do it. But if you don't want to do it, that's okay. You know, totally up to you. And so I think giving people that flexibility of deciding to join, you know, it's just like the all volunteer army, you know, it's, you, know you, you decide to sign up, you mm -hmm. don't get drafted, you don't get assigned. And that's really the first step of showing people that you trust them uh, to make the right decisions. And that's hard. It's hard. It's hard for a manager to let go of that and trust. But I've, I've seen situations in which that was the way it, it worked and, and worked in organizations where that's the way it worked. And sometimes to add a new team member, it took six months to get, you know, everybody through the whole process. And, but the candidate wanted to join and, and everybody, you know, and it took every, a while to get everybody on board with it. But, you know, once you brought that new person on board, everybody on the team was behind that person in terms of helping them to be successful. And, and, and the other thing that we, we talk about somewhere is that every time you change composition on a team, you've got to go through that whole forming, norming, mm -hmm. storming, you know, forming, storming, norming, performing kind of cycle. And, and you recognize, and that's something that I think a lot of managers don't really understand either is that they think people are interchangeable cogs and you can just mix and match them. And boy, that's a, that's a really dangerous yep. uh, philosophy. Yep. Uh, uh, Craig Larman calls it the meat widget, right? When you refer to a person as a resource, you're calling them a meat widget. And we've talked a lot about in the show about how people are not fungible. They're not fungible. They're, yeah. Each person is uniquely different. And you change them. Like you said, when you add someone, when you take someone away, when someone goes through a life-altering event on a team, which is another thing we don't really talk about, that team dynamic can change. It's a living, mm -hmm. breathing I think that, what is it, the third chair, I think they use an ORSC training where there's me and then there's you and then there's the relationship that we have. And that that third entity, third entity they call it, is always changing. Um, you talked about grabbing someone and assigning them to a team. There was a, another section of the book that I thought was really fascinating where how we, stu stupid human agile tricks, right, is, is what it, the subtitle should be, where Mm -hmm. sometimes what we typically do is we sit down and we figure out what we want to do. And we want to go agile and how we're going to do it. We're going to use safe. And then we figure out who is impacted. And then after that, we think about the why after that as a postscript. Right. And in the book, mm -hmm. you say that the smarter way to think about it is first you identify who is going to be impacted and why the who and the why are the first things you look at. And then from there, you end up with, well, how are we going to do this? Which then talks about the what. And that was, again, that was another, that we've had this conversation on the show before about how a lot of practitioners are not really agile about how they do their agile. And this is one of those literally putting the cart before the horse and then getting, it's that, it's that meme of the guy riding the bike who leans forward and sticks the, the, the stick in the spokes and then flips over the handlebar and says, why would you do this to me? We do it to ourselves, don't we, Kurt? Right, right. And, and, and the thing about, um, you know, there, there are a certain number of people in the organization who really want to change. They're frustrated with the way that the organization works. They feel, um, in, in some cases, kind of uh, repressed or restrained. Um, and they really want to change. And so those are the people you want to tap into their energy. But you can't do that if you basically say that, um, okay, you know, here's this process. You're you're going to follow it. You you have to let them mm -hmm. work out what what makes sense to them. I mean, you can give guidance, um, but th so that that's why the who is important. Um, the why is important is because becoming agile is a really shitty goal. Right. It is. Right. It is. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> right. So, so the question is, you have to ask is, why do you want to become agile? What will becoming agile do? What do you think becoming agile will do for you? And then you follow that and you say, okay, so we want to become, you know, so it might, it might turn into, well, we need to be more responsive to customer needs. And you say, why do you want to do that? I mean, it's like the five whys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why do you want to do that? Well, you know, because we don't think that they're very happy with us right now. Ah, okay. So we want to, and, and I noticed, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the satisfaction gap idea, but the, the, the real goal in business is to close the, we think anyway, is to close a gap between what the, what a customer currently experiences and what they would like to experience. 
And so this idea of the satisfaction gap is, is really, in a sense, the source of all goals, we, I, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so getting to that and saying, okay, so now we have a goal that we could actually work toward. We can measure you know, how satisfied are they now. And then we can deliver something to them and saying, did that help or that, did, that, did that hurt? And research says that basically, you know, about, um, and, and I think we reference this in the book, but there's a really interesting um, study, series of studies now um, that a guy named Ronnie Kohabi, who's to be a VP at Microsoft did. And, and so there's this um, thing called exp-platform.com, I think is the, is the website, but really interesting data there, but it boils down to this. About a third of the ideas that people come up with are, are actually re result in a positive change, the change you're looking for. About a third of the ideas don't change anything at all. And about a third of things actually make things worse. And think about any product release that you've, you've gotten. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the prop, your, your own experiences probably um, correspond to that. I know mine, mine have. And, and so the, the, what's behind that is that you don't really know what's going to make customers happy until you deliver something to them and then measure the result. And so that's what Agile is really about. It's, a, it's allowing us to deliver things in short increments and measure. And you know, we find so many organizations that they consider Agile to be, oh, it, we're shipping faster, but they never measure the result. And so basically, they, you know, if two thirds of what you do is, is of no value or negative value, you're just producing waste faster. So <laughs> right, right. agility, back, back to what we started with before, it's about learning. It's about, you know, having an interaction with your customers, you know, delivering something them, to them and saying, well, was that better? Did I make your life better? And, you know, sometimes you don't. Um, and then, then you, as um, you know, we often say you inspect and adapt and mm -hmm. you, you plan the next increment. And this is sort of, you know, the reason why traditional waterfall doesn't work is essentially because most of your ideas are bad and you, you have to- You take a long time to get them out the door, yeah. Yeah, and then you yeah. never measure the result, and, and you wonder why the company doesn't do well. Anyway, I, you know, so that kind of long, um, long way of getting around to this this idea that, um, you know, back back to what you said is that the the why ends up being really important. The who is really important too, because you can't have people who don't want to be there and who don't want to work in that new way of, in a sense, questioning, you know, almost everything. And then, you know, you have to let them figure figure out, and you know, things like you know, Scrum or other Agile approaches are things that might give them some ideas about how they might want to work. And, you know, I work for scrum.org. So, you know, I, I think those are good ideas, but the most important thing is that, is that the team itself has to want to work that way. Right. And you, you can't push it on them. And if you try, you're actually going to get a backlash. Right, you're inflicting, you're inflicting the change. People, uh, people don't mind change. They don't like change being done to them. This is the organizational antibodies. You're, you're basically right. pushing into a rubber band. And then we act completely surprised when that rubber band comes back with the cream pie, gets us right in the face, <laughs> right? It, it's kind of, yeah. again, it's self-inflicted. So I'm glad you talked about the satisfaction gap and you talked about being customer-centric and thinking about what customers want. Um, so for our listeners that haven't read the book, uh, the book is... Um, there's theory and practice in here. There's a narrative that goes along with it with a company called Reliable Energy, which is going through a merger. One part of the company is our traditional way of working. The other part is an agile company. There's a section here where I read it and I burst out laughing and I definitely scared the shit out of the guy sitting next to me on the plane where you were. there was a, a discussion about the leadership inside the organization. And they're talking about goals and measures and, and what are the things we need to look at. And there's a quote here where, they're talking about reliable energy is the customer, and, and the narrative says, uh, the big realization that these leaders came to is that most of reliable energy's products and services don't measure customer satisfaction gaps as their primary measure. Instead, they focus on internal measures such as revenue and profit. While these items are important, they provide little insight into where the organization can improve and where it can capitalize on new opportunities. So I scared the hell out of the guy sitting next to me on the plane, and here's why. I have brought this up numerous times in numerous jobs and it always gets me in trouble and i bring it up when i am when, and it's almost a visceral reaction to when i see that typical slide kurt where somebody's talking about the goals for the next quarter next year next five ten whatever years there's always a blurb about increased revenue reduce operating expense 
And I I have this visceral reaction to that because, and the example I always give is my cell phone. I've got a Samsung Galaxy Note S something, whatever, right? I don't really care about Samsung's profitability. I don't care about their OPEX. The reason I always buy a Samsung whenever my phone is up is I enjoy it. I have a good experience. So you need to think about what are your customers' experience? What's their interaction with your product? Because honestly, I don't care about Samsung's revenue or OPEX. And you know what? If they go out of business tomorrow, I'll be really sad because I really like the product, but I'll find another product to delight me. And we, yeah, I, yeah. every time I bring this up, I get in trouble because somebody is like, what do you mean? We don't care about revenue or OPEX. I'm like, we do, but that's a bad proxy for business success. Right. Yeah. Th- there, there are so many, you know, and we could come up with lots of examples about, you know, why, focusing on revenue and cost is, is actually a bad motivation. Um, it's the thing that basically results in stuff like Enron, uh, if you remember that, right. yep. where, where, where basically, you know, you've got people gaming the system um, because it's easy. It's actually easy in the short run to boost revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, might kill you in the long run. The same thing with, with, um, with cost is that, you know, you could instantaneously make yourself infinitely profitable by firing everybody in the company. And we're running, you know, out in the world right now, there's an experiment. There's a couple of companies <laughs> trying that experiment. But you're, you're right. When you reduce, if you're, if you're trying to maniacally reduce OPEX, there comes a point where you start to negatively impact the customer experience. So what good is it saving all this operational expense? If I negatively impact the customers, that's going to get, Peter Merrill talks about it all the time with Xcale. You get into this really terrible loop where you're right. literally almost like circling the brain. Yeah. And, and so you have to look at, with cost, you have to look at why are you doing that? And it gets back to customer satisfaction. Um, and almost everything can be related to that. You could say, you know, should we reduce the number of, of call centers? I don't know. How would that reduce customer sat? Um, and the answer really mm-hmm. is that we don't know, but let's run an experiment. Um, let's right. see what happens when, when we do that. Um, and let's do it in small steps. Let's like not, you know, not automatically let half the people in customer service go and see what happens. But, you know, let's, let's see, is there a correlation between, you know, the essentially, you know, it could be something just like call volume and customer sat. Well, Mm -hmm. it could be positive, could be negative. You know, it's like, why are you calling uh, customer service? It might be because the the product itself is deficient and you need lots of help to be able to use it. Or it could be because, um, you know, because of something else. So it gives you an opportunity to look at, well, how can we resolve that that satisfaction gap and, and not do it in a way that's simply throwing customer service reps at it. But, but maybe actually let's create a product that doesn't require customer service reps for certain kinds of problems. Right. And so we could look at, at, the, at the call volume. You know. So anyway, we're, we're getting sort of deep into the example. But the, the point is, is that um, profit is so easy to gain um, that it's actually dangerous to give people goals based on that. Um, it's, and, and it also has lots of inputs. And so no one person in the company controls profit. You know, right. not even the CEO. So you can't really go to somebody and say, okay, you know, you do this because there's complex interactions between profit and cost and everything else. Right. And so very I, complex. You know, we, yeah. we, we, we just feel like the, those profit based goals, and, and we said it in the quote, you know, while, while not unimportant, the real goals have to come from somewhere else. And so that's, that's really what we're trying to say there. And, and the funny thing about this book, you know, it, it's titled The Professional Agile Leader, but there, there were many times in writing the book that I felt like this isn't just about leadership. This is about changing an organization. Absolutely. And, and you have to affect goals. You have to affect the culture. You have to affect the team structure. And um, at, at the risk of digression, culture is one of those words that is kind of a trigger word for me because it's like, Everybody talks about it and they talk about changing the culture, but they're never, most of the time, they don't do anything that actually changes the culture. And I feel like culture doesn't change by lecturing people about what the new no. culture needs to be. No. It, it's, it changes by people working together on, on a, a, a collaboratively on a problem and having success or, or having sort of shared failure that they then work through to success. 
that's what changes. That's what I feel like is the culture. And so, you know, we wanted to convey that and not, and not have a bunch of, you know, outside consultants and motivational speakers come in and talk about, well, you know, we need to have an agile culture and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> mindset, whatever. mindset, culture, mindset, mindset. You're, you're absolutely right. You, you can't change people's minds. You can't change people's behaviors by talking. It's by doing and demonstrating the value, the, the behavior that you want to see. Uh, culture is nothing more than a, basically a just <laughs> of, of, I honestly think it's kind of dark to think this, but culture isn't what you aspire to be. Culture is what you tolerate as a company. So if they're, if you're really trying to change a company's culture and there's a notorious bad actor, <coughs> that bad actor needs to be removed is one of the quickest way, which will be one of the quickest ways to not necessarily change in a lasting way, but to poke the system, poke the culture into moving in the direction that you would like it to move into. Right, right. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you tolerate the bad behaviors, and this gets back to the, the leader being dictatorial, if you tolerate the bad behaviors, then you're tacitly approving them. Yes, 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 absolutely. If you tolerate it and you don't, and you let it go unpunished, right? It's it's like, well, my mom never let me get away with not cleaning my room. I never got away with not cleaning my room because what would have happened? I would have grown up to be a sloppy adult. Now, my wife would tell you that I'm a sloppy adult, but that's not entirely true. I, I do keep everything clean within a distance, but you're right. What you What the behavior that you let, people get away with right which you tolerate there's an unsaid said there that this is okay and you need to remove that what is what people are interpreting as okay yeah you had um there was a another um there was a, a great it was a great quote here when you started talking about empowerment and leaders and um there was a uh when you're going through the case study in the article here you said there's a line that Everyone loves agility and still it start, until it starts to undermine their own perceived authority. And that was another one of those where I, I highlighted it, put a flag there. I'm like, because it's, it's one of those duh statements that, yes, that's when people, when the organizational antibodies that we talked about, I think that's when they start to rise up when people feel threatened by the new status quo is not looking like the old status quo. Right. Yeah, and, and, and I think especially, th this is why middle and upper management often, I feel like, and I've observed this, um, they, they struggle with the change because in a sense, you know, they've, they've been there, you know, 10, 15, 20, maybe more years. And, and they've been do doing what they thought was the right thing. And they've been rewarded and they moved up. And all of a sudden, kind of what we were talking with the product owner um, and the business analyst, all of a sudden, the organization is telling them what you did was bad, bad, mm -hmm. bad, bad. And, you know, they're not the, sh they're, they're not the shining exemplars of the wh where the organization needs to go. And, and I've, I've had um, basically people shouting at me <laughs> in, in, in organizations because they felt like I was calling them out for, for not in a sense, not having the interest of the organization at heart. And, and it's a, a change in perception because um, they, they honestly believe that their approach is the right one for the organization. We have this character in the narrative who resigns because he thinks the direction the company is going is wrong. And he, he's the head of the PMO. And he feels like, you know, we're just, we're, we're, we're letting these teams run willy nilly and, you know, without any kind of controls and, and, you know, it's just the wrong way to do it. And, you know, we, I've successfully delivered program after program, and now you're telling me that's not the right way to do it. You know what, from their perspective, they're right. But what they, what they don't realize is that they're working under a set of assumptions where they, they believe that it's possible to define all the requirements up front, to do all the design work up front. They do a, a ton of work and they deliver it. And they, and they believe that that's the way to reduce waste and reduce cost and whatever. And you know, if, what, if their initial assumptions were true, if it was possible to define all the requirements up front and to find a solution, they would be right. Absolutely. The, the problem is that we can't. In, in a complex environment, and Dave Snowden's great about you know, talking about this with the Kinevin model is that in a, in a complex world, you basically have to, 
I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, and, and if he listens to this podcast, he'll probably blow a gasket. But, you know, essentially in, in a complex... We're having him on in three weeks. I'll, I'll make sure I play the clip and let him rebut it. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> that, that'll, that'll be really helpful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, basically you, you've got to try things. Um, measure, measure, and that's the important thing. Me measure the effect of what you do, you're doing and then adapt. And, you know, based on that, that research I talked about before, um, you know, we really, for the most part, don't know what we're talking about most of the time. And we're making it up as we go along. And, you know, I, I, I have a fragment of a movie scene in my head where somebody, you know, they get criticized for saying, you're just making this up as we go along, as you go along and say, you know, actually, yes, we are. We are making this up as we go along. And that's a good thing. Um, but anyway, it's, um, so I think that, that, that difference in, you know, as a leader, you have to be respectful of those, those people's perspective. They are, they are going to lose status if, if, and, and we, we flip this around in the book, we say, it's up to you as to whether you lose status. If you basically exhibit leadership, the right kind of leadership behaviors to help grow this organization in this new direction your status will actually increase. Yes. Because people will respect what you're doing for them and they will respect what you're doing for the organization. But if you stick to the old ways and, and you basically try to fight this whole thing, then your status is going to decline. Right. You, you have a, there's a quote here that actually highlighted that. I think it was page 82. By appearing to give away their own status, leaders actually increase it. It's the demonstration of, and I, and I immediately thought of Jorgen Hesselberg's book, where he talked about the the head of HR from from Nokia when they were going through their big change trying to save the company. And someone asked her in a town hall, "So how are we going to do this?" And she said, "I'm going to be honest. I don't know." And that was a very honest okay. way to not only endear yourself to the other employees, but they understand that we're all on this journey together. But there was something you said. Kurt, in the example, and I forgot about that example in the book about the PMO head who leaves, where this is the, the subtitle of this book really should have been um, Uncomfortable Agile Truths That We Don't Say Out Loud Outside of Our Own Friends, is the fact that the, uh, the, the tacit acknowledgement that there are some people that when we embark on one of these journeys, one of these transformations, this type of change, any type of organizational change, sometimes not everybody, sometimes not everybody wants to go along with it. And sometimes not everybody needs to. And that's okay. That's okay. We need to, like you said, humanely acknowledge that and to help these people find somewhere that they will be happy. And that is, right. that's one of those things that we don't say out loud to each other. We probably should talk more about is there are some people that really don't want to make the change for whatever reason. And that's okay. If you're a good leader, you will recognize that and help them find somewhere to be happy. Right. Right. And it's really tough because at the beginning of the journey, you don't know who those people will be. Right. And so it, it feels a little bit, um, it feels like you're hiding something or it feels like you're not being fully transparent because at the beginning of the journey, you say stuff like, you know, this is something we're all going on. And the reality is, is that not everyone is, is going to finish that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable and, you know, but but in a way, as a leader, you can't say that at the beginning. Um, right. So so you have to, in, a, in effect, act in good faith um, because really it's up to the individuals to decide, do they want to be part of the journey or not? There's, there is more than enough work. This is not, um, uh -huh. as, as anybody who's been through it, uh, you know, becoming agile is not a staff reduction strategy. It's because when you start improving customer outcomes and you get the better results, there ends up being more work to do. You know, right. I mean, right. unless you're unless you're in a world where where you can make your customers, you know, instantaneous or you know, very quickly, super happy. But what happens is that, like all of us, you know, the more we get, the more we want. Um, so it's, but you know, you get rewards from that because, you know, the the thing is, is if you're improving that satisfaction gap you know, like, like your example with the, your, your phone, you I mean, those phones are not cheap. I, I happen mm -hmm. to like the Apple devices, but they're not cheap either. And, 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 but, you know, you're willing to give up a substantial amount of money for the things it does for you. And you're happy about that. Right. 
And so, you know, it's, um, you know, but if somebody had told me 20 years ago that I would be paying a thousand dollars or more than a thousand dollars for a phone, even if I translate that back to, you know, to, to, you know, what money so, was yeah. worth then, I, I would have said, no, you're, you're joking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're thinking about my original sprint flip phone, like, ah, oh, no, no. Well, I, I'm one of those people, are, you know, I, I certainly can't see the future. And, and the first time, probably in about maybe 2001 or so, I was in Sweden and I, I saw a Sony Ericsson phone with a camera in it. And it's like a one megapixel, maybe. And, and, the, and I thought, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Who would ever want a camera and a phone? Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, there are some people that, I mean, who would have thought that you have a PDA, a phone, uh, internet browser, a camera, a G, uh, uh, what amounts to a Garmin, all this stuff, all this stuff built onto your phone. Um, so you talked about, you talked about early on, I want to come back to this. You talked about the idea of a dual operating model inside of a company. And when we, yeah. in the example yeah. in the book with reliable energy, where they're a traditional company that acquires an agile way of working company, and they're trying to kind of melt these things and make the change because the agile way of working is obviously the better way of working. And, and in this, in this, especially in this instance, and you have a, you have a section, a chunk in the book where you talk about the, the leader's role is to, like you said, create the space and protect that agile modality or, or the, the iterative modality while the old world is there. And the quote here that I, that I highlighted was to be successful the agile leader must demonstrate that the new approach will work while protecting it from the old system that at all, although it may be failing in many respects is still strong enough to protect itself when threatened with obsolescence. Yep. And that, that comes back to the organizational antibodies that comes back to the Sengi system pushing back right. as a good agile yep. leader, you need to build that frame, that scaffolding. So when people push against it, they can't try to kill it in the womb because we talked about lack of status all that. That's what will happen. Yeah. And, and another thing that usually is happening at the same time is that that traditional organization represents probably 90 plus percent of the revenue and the profits for the company at the beginning. So you don't want to ups, upset that apple cart either. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, you know, there, there were some famous attempts at um, like uh, at, at people trying to change big organizations like Jeff ML to GE, you know, they went on a big push to sort of software is going to be in everything. We need to make everybody agile. And, and, and there were some, um, what I, I, I don't have enough insight into what hap happens inside the company, but, you know, at the time they did that, they were going through a transition um, of business models and a lot of their main lines of business and some were declining, but the main money makers were still the traditional businesses. And, you know, as a result, there was a lot of internal pushback on that. And ultimately, even the CEO lost out in that. Um, now, there may have been complex other reasons that, that I don't know, but, but, it, but that kind of pattern shows up a lot is that the, the traditional organization is, is good at doing certain things. Um, it's, just not, it's just not good enough for where you think you need to go. Right. And so at, as a result, the, the agile leader feels like we need to make this this change before basically we completely collapse. And so they're they're betting that you know we need to have this greater responsiveness, this greater connection to customers, and we have to work in a different way. But you know we and we specifically picked um, this this energy example because there's a huge transformation going on in energy right now where you've got traditional generating companies that you know have been regulated for many years and yet you've got all this new stuff like solar panels and wind and electric vehicles and new new loads and and new threats from you know people hacking into mm -hmm. into smart the, meters uh, and stuff yep you know s smart meters and things like that so so there's a big transformation going on and yet you know you, in the short run you can't just say okay customers stop you know we're we're going to put everything on pause for a couple of years while we uh, while we figure out this this new way of working, but it's it's going to be really great. Trust us. <laughs> right. It does. Um, that doesn't. So, that's not work. Doesn't bode well for success going forward. No. 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 But um, but the thing we we mentioned later on in the book is that there will become a critical mass when you have to make a choice. And 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 one of the things we were soft pedaling this a little bit in writing the book, and one of our reviewers 
made a really astute observation that got us to think about uh, about this in the same way. And that is that, do we think that there is any part of the organization that would not benefit from having self-managing teams that are closer to the to their customers uh, that, that making decisions? In other words, is there any part of the organization mm -hmm. that we think the top-down decision-making of you know the, that traditional model works better? And you know, we thought about it and said, no, there probably isn't any part of it. And sometimes people bring up things like, well, what about the accounting department? But I actually work, I've worked in an accounting department um, and not, not doing accounting, I was doing um, supporting systems and things like that. But the reality was is that the people who actually did the day-to-day -day work, they understood the business a lot better than the executives did because they saw the transactions coming through. Yep. And, and they understood um, a, a lot more than I think they were given credit for. And, and, you know, the same is true in law, the same thing is true in HR. And, and so really, you know, what we're trying to do with the book is we're trying to re reshape what the role of the executive in the organization is. And that's, that's a very subversive mm -hmm. thing. But, but we're trying to say, in a sense, you don't know enough to be telling people what to do. You do know how this organization works, mm -hmm. and you do know um, how how to help people uh, produce their best if if you let yourself do that. And so we're trying to get them to shift their focus into growing teams, helping the teams be more effective, supporting the teams in what they do, and not trying to be the big smart person making all the decisions. But again, that's changed for people. That's very threatening because in many cases, if you look back at, at that old book, The Peter Principle, um, uh -huh. if you remember the, what, what uh -huh. that was about. You know, people are promote people are promote a point of their own incompetency. You know, they're afraid of, people are afraid of that. And and here, you know, it's saying all of those those things that got you to where you were, being a good individual individual contributor, that's not what your job is anymore. Your job is to help other people do what you did better right 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 true servant leadership where the idea of a hierarchy which is how we traditionally view leadership in an organization flip that upside yeah. down and make it from a pyramid that i had a great an old boss shout out to sarah say you need to conceptually take that pyramid and turn it upside down and have it resemble a net because that's what yeah. good leadership is truly in the servant spaces you're supporting the people below you who are supporting the people below them it's it's truly a a a, a uh, um, almost like a, a high wire act. You're the one making sure that if something does go wrong, you're there to help reassess, realign, and then and make it go forward. So we we've, we've covered a ton, uh, Kurt, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. But there is a line here that I specifically need to call you out because if I had to pay you a dollar every time I said it, I'd be making mortgage payments to Kurt Bittner Inc. And it's late in yeah. the book when you start talking about leadership and transparency, and you say the line. Facts are friendly. And this I have beaten to death and in and, 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 and my current place because it that that honesty that comes with that statement that if it's just a fact, it it's not in malicious, it's not it's not trying to manipulate things, it just is. Right. And a truly transparent, mature organization, these are these are not things that go wrong or things that go right, they're just things that happen and taking the emotion out of it. I've had I've had some good luck, a good experience, not gonna lie, with pitching the the metrics that we use to look at how we're doing is look, this isn't good or bad, it just is. How we react to it right. is a different monster. And that was one of those, right. like again, I highlighted it almost drove through the page because I think that was brilliant. Yeah. And I, and actually I, I I have to give credit where that's due. So uh, gosh, you know, probably more than 20 years ago. And and I'll 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 say his name because I think I think he deserves credit for it. I don't know where he got it, but I was working for a guy named Roger Oberg um, when I was working at Rational Software, and that was one of the things that it was it was kind of a mantra with Roger. And I remembered that, and and it was really a, a really kind of simple statement, but it's easy to remember. Um, uh, the the other line, you know, if you remember the original. Um, Pirates of the Caribbean movie, there was a line that Jack Sparrow says, it's a little bit longer, and he says, the problem is not the problem. Your reaction to the problem is the problem. <laughs> I do remember that, yes. 
or, or, or something to that effect. But that, that's the same kind of thing is that, um, you know, the facts are just what they are. And, you know, you, you can get upset about that, but um, it doesn't really help you. Um, you just need to say, okay, new information. How do I take this in and adapt to it? Um, and, 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 but organizations are particularly inoculated against um, sort of facts. They're like there's this old saying that occasionally man, and, and I'm using this in the generic sense, uh, a person will stumble across the truth, but they usually get up, pick themselves up and move on. <laughs> um, very true, and, very uh, true. And, and so, you know, we, we all, you know, all of us co-authors have this, um, have, have this experience where the team will start to get information about, um, let's say, uh, you know, they shipped a feature and it turns out, you know, this was the, the big feature that some executive, you know, argued for and said, we must have this. You know, I've talked to all these different other executives and they all say this is important. You ship it, and nobody uses it. Or, you know, mm -hmm. you measure the satisfaction and it's like, you know, so it could be a UI problem, but, let, but let's say it's not. You, you decide it's not useful. Well, we've had um, managers come to the team and say, you can't publish that. You can't make that visible because it will make some of the or in, high up in the organization look bad. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's why you need to try to get them to believe facts are friendly. It's like, you know what? It, it's not going to help the organization if you keep put, pouring more money into this thing that nobody actually wants. Yep. And we all yep. do that. Um, so because we have mistaken ideas of what customers really want. And and the other, you know, a slight digression about, about customers is that you know, you also can't ask customers what they want, right? You know, it, like Henry like, Ford said, if I built my customers <laughs> wanted, I would have made a faster horse. Yep. Yeah. Or, or you know, I, I always used to say, um, uh, you know, users don't know what they want, but they know what they don't want when they see it. <laughs> and, Very true. Very true. So, so, you know, you have to figure out other ways to measure. Um, this was a problem that came up back in the, I think in the 1980s when, uh, people were working on early AI and expert systems is that they would interview experts about how, how do you do this thing? And they could never, they couldn't figure out why, why what they were developing didn't work until they observed what the experts did and, and what the experts did didn't match up with what they said they did. So you, you <laughs> have to figure out other ways of measuring that customer satisfaction gap because surveys are really bad. Um, you, they, people tell you what they think you want to hear, or they tell you what they think they did, but they don't really self-reflect very well and so on. So it's, it's, it's really complicated. And, and that's what makes all of this hard because, you know, if it was easy, we could just do customer satisfaction surveys, come up with a list of requirements, yep. deliver it, and, and we'd be good. And that's what we've done for years. And, you know, that old joke or that old saying about what's the definition of insanity um, doing the same thing yeah, over and over and again, so, and expecting different results. Yep, yep. Right, and and so that's kind of the, in a sense, the, the essence of the waterfall approach is that you know you, you you're making decisions based on limited information, a lot of assumptions, and and you never measure the results, and and somehow the organization fails to perform the way that you would like it to, and so you know we have to do it a different way, and um, but uh, yeah, no, it's. I'm glad that that you know those those things that we put in there um, stand out. And and the other thing that one of the things that I'm I'm proud of the book is that it's pretty short. Like you could read it on a you read it on a flight. Yeah, there is a lot jammed into not a lot of pages, not a lot of pages at all. I mean, it's not a. Uh, I'm over here look thinking about some of the other things I have slogged my way through. Um, there was there was. Um, uh, what's a what's it brevity? Uh, is the one is that humor or is that shortness? Um, well, there's no lacking. There's yeah. no lacking. It's yeah, it's, it's like, succinct and there's enough that even I think it's like 190 pages, Kurt. I think all said and done, I was less than that. It was 100 and 172, and I went through it twice because I went back and highlighted some of the stuff that I and I, I read through the I segmented just the case study again because it's. It really is a lot packed into not a lot of space. Well, there, there's a there's a quote that I I, I really love, and it's um, um, from a a French 
aviator slash author, the, the author of The Little Prince, but he also wrote some other books. Um, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, I think, is that I'm probably butchering the French. But, it, but anyway, one of the things that he said is that perfection exists not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. And so that, uh, the other thing is that when I was in, in college, I remember one of the professors said uh, about research papers that we had to turn in, he says, brevity and clarity command the premium in the job, in, in the uh, <laughs> And the great market. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very true. I had a, I worked for an executive who was a senior VP once who we got reorged under him. And I, I was in a meeting where he turned and said, if you send me an email longer than three lines, I'm not going to read it. Pick up the phone. And that was kind of like, you know, in the corporate world, it was kind of jarring. What do you mean pick up the phone? And he said flat out, I'm not going to read it. I don't have the time for this. Uh, Mark Twain. I wish I had more time to write you a shorter letter, right? It's, it, right. it takes hard work. So uh, we're, we're quickly, quickly coming up on out of time. Uh, for those listeners, we barely even scratched the surface on all the stuff that's in here. I had another half page of, of just call outs that we could go through. Um, this was the first conversation about this book. We are going to get Ron and Lorenz uh, on the show as well to do their own episodes. However, with time zone differences and being in Europe, it's scheduling is a little bit more daunting, but we are going to get there. So this is the first in the series. Uh, but Kurt, um, before I wrap us up, if people want to get more interested, they want to find the book. They want to reach out to you. They maybe want to follow you on, on a social media site, maybe get some insights. Where do they go? Where do they look? Uh, so a couple of things. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I don't I do not do the, the T site. I gave that up actually a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, and uh, gave up gave up the uh, what's now become meta. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> I don't think Mark Zuckerberg does uh, either, but that's a conversation for another episode. <laughs> probably not, but 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 LinkedIn's a good place. And usually, when I when I write a blog or, or an article or something, um, I I sort of post a link there. Um, you could go to to scrum.org and find my blog page, but probably the easiest thing to do is find um, LinkedIn. Um, but you know, the, actually, the scrum.org blog blog uh, page will. Uh, give you the articles that I've written in the past that sort of relate to this topic. Um, as we were talking, I mean, I, I really feel like the book has encapsulated a lot of the thinking that we've had over um, o- over a, a really long period of time. And so you know, I encourage people to pick that up. It's it's a pretty, you know, we, we wanted it to be a quick, easy read. Um, doesn't try to do everything under the sun, um, as we uh-huh. talked to begin with. Um, but, but we try to share the common problems that we've seen in almost every single agile transformation um, and, and some, you know, and try to call out some of the, the more difficult challenges, as you've said, you know, some of the things that are the things that nobody tells you. Um, some of the things are the things that nobody, that people would like to say, but, but they don't feel like they can call that out. Right. Um, but in a fic- in a fictional setting, we can do that more easily. <laughs> right. Um, say the say the quiet part out loud. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And we and and so that helps. Um, but yeah, I, I think those those sources are are good places to start. I, um, and I, I hope readers get you know get get equivalent things to what you did. I mean, you know, what I find with with books or really any any experience is that. Um, what you see a lot is what you already know reflected back to you. Um, and so what this will probably do for a lot of people is that they'll, they'll read it, they'll read the book and they'll say, ah, that's why that happened. Or they'll read it and go, yep, same thing, seen that before or <laughs> something like that. But what we tried to do is go beyond that sort of um, mutual commiseration to try to give people some strategies for how to how to overcome it and not you know we're we're trying to say you know in a sense start here start start with you know helping the team form and then gradually you know work on um you know building up their ability to take on more responsibility and you know protect them from the rest of the organization and and these other things and so um there's a little bit of a start here, do this, do that. But it's more, in a sense, a pattern. It's not- Right, right. Um, not prescriptive. But, but you know, no, we're trying not to be prescriptive because as, as we talked earlier, everybody, everybody's journey is a little bit different um, and they'll have different issues. Um, 
but they probably will have a lot of the same things that the the case study yep. company had. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, Perfect. but th th thanks, thanks for having having me on. It's always a pleasure to no, uh, talk to you. Uh, and, uh, Kurt, I, I really need to thank you for coming on, and behalf of our listeners, I thank you for tuning tuning in. Um, this is actually uh, Johanna Rothman. If you're listening, Kurt's been on three times now, so he's approaching your record. You might want to ring us up. I know you've probably written six books in the last time we've had you on. So if you're listening, please reach out. We'd love to have you on again. Uh, but in all seriousness, Kurt, thank you very much for your for your time. We really appreciate it. On behalf of Kurt and uh, our list, uh, myself, I want to thank all of you listeners. Uh, if you enjoyed what you heard, give us a rating review. Uh, shout us out on your podcast app, Listening of Choice. It does help other people find us. If you enjoyed the conversation, please hop in on our Discord server. It is quite jumping and quite bumping. Um, there has been multiple experiments launched out of that. We actually have a quasi-informal class on clean language running now. So if you're interested, please hop onto Discord and, and the server will be listed in the show notes. Um, last but not least, we're dedicated to being free always in every every way. However, we do have a Patreon if you're interested in, off, in donating to offset production costs. Cost, that will be listed in the show notes as well. So once again, I want to thank uh, Kurt for his time. Uh, we look forward to the next two episodes in the series as co-authors. I want to thank all of you for listening. And until next time, this is the Agile Uprising Podcast signing out.